for the new. I'm thankful for the old. I honor the old, but I'm glad for the new. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you turn this morning to the book of Esther, uh, Sunday school, if they've not already dismissed, you're free to go to your classes. There should be somebody to help assist. We thank the Lord for our children and our teachers. Praise the Lord. Esther chapter 2. And lately I've been trying to think up things, you know, to go along with the message, demonstrations. And I do not have Esther in the back room, so we were, were clear there this morning. But Esther chapter 2, beginning at verse 2, it says, Then said the king's servant that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the providences of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan, the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Heg, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. Verse 4 says, And let the maidens which please the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the things pleased, and the thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now we skip down. We, we see that verses five through seven introduce us to a young Jewish girl named Hadassah, or more commonly known, Esther. Let's jump down to verse eight. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decrees was heard. And when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, to the custody of Heg, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house, unto the custody of Heg, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her things for purification with such things uh, belonging to her, and uh, seven maidens which were met to be given to her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. We jump down to verse 12. Now when every maid's turn was to come and to go into the king, uh, king Asher, after that she had been uh, 12 months according to the manner of the women. For so were the days of their purification accomplished, to wit six months oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors and with other things for purifying of the women. Then thus came every maiden unto the king, whosoever she desires, whatsoever she desires was given to her to go with her to the house of the women and to the king's house. In the evening she went and on the morrow she returned to the second house of the women to the custody of Shazar, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abna, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come into, to go into the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberman, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto the king Asher into the house royal into the tenth, in the tenth month, which is the tenth month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her, and made her queen instead of Vashi. We find the date is approximately 483 B.C. We are told this history of an orphan girl. A girl who seemingly had nothing going for her. A girl who was not with the in crowd. 
She was a part of a nation that was looked down upon. After all, they were exiled into a strange land. Come on, somebody. Have you ever felt like you weren't in the in crowd? Have you ever felt like you were an outsider? I'm sure the leaders of the city were not running to her for counsel. After all, why should they? She was just an orphan girl being raised by her relative named Mordecai. But can I tell you this morning that things are not always as they seem. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for your presence. Lord, I thank you that even though we look with our natural eyes, Lord, help us to look at the spirit realm. Lord, because what is in operating in the spirit realm can be totally different than what we see with our natural eyes. Things are not always as they seem. Lord, anoint your people to hear your word. Anoint me to speak your word this morning. Help us to hear what the spirit is saying to the church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to bring to you a challenge. I want to challenge you today not to follow the same course as the children of this world by seeing things with our physical eyes. We must strive and we must long to see things in the spirit because that is the spirit that governs the world that we're in right now. Things are operating in this world and leaders are operating in this world in accordance with the spirit realm and the war that's going on in the spirit. We must understand that it's not just what we see, but it's what we don't see that is affecting what's going on. You see, the world can't help it. Their spiritual eyes have been darkened to things that are happening all around us right now. But as believers, our eyes are to be open to spiritual things. Things are not always as they seem. I want you to tell that to the person next to you. Things are not always as they seem. In verse 8, we are told a decree was made by the king that all maidens were to be gathered unto himself because he was in need of a queen. Church, for 2,000 years, the king of kings has been calling out to lost humanity pleading with people to come to him, pleading that they would be his bride. One day soon, and I believe very soon, we're going to hear that call for the last time. We're going to hear that clarion call for the last time. And we say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Can somebody say amen this morning? So we see that this orphan girl was taken to the house in waiting, if you will where she finds many other women who are there for the same purpose she is there for. They are vying for the position of queen. Each maiden has one night with the king. And it was custom that each of them go through a year of purification. A year, can you imagine? Before they could be presented To the king. See, these ladies were not acceptable as they were. They weren't acceptable in their own ability. It's not, it's not because they were unclean. It's simply because in themselves they were not good enough. Oh, come on, somebody, nudge your neighbor and tell him, in myself, I wasn't good enough. Oh, but Jesus came to my rescue. Come on, somebody. How many has been rescued by Jesus? The scripture says that our our own righteousness is as filthy rags. We have to be purified before we go before the king. Verse 12 tells us that the first six months they received an intense oil of myrrh treatment. And the second six months they received treatments of sweet odors which consisted of perfumes and spices. They would take these oils and spices and place them on cosmetic burners. Then they would put on large robes and they would sit over the burners 
and, and the, the, the oils and the smells of the perfume would be, it would be like a personal fragrance sauna. It would, the fragrance would get into their very pores to such a point that they would ooze sweet fragrance. Also, the women were taught etiquette. They were taught how to talk like a queen. See, as royalty, you have to watch what you say because your word becomes law. Come on, tell somebody. See, I'm watching what I say. I'm watching what I say. They have to be taught to walk like a queen. I believe they were walking circles in the courtyard with books on their head. They had to learn how to carry themselves like a queen so they wouldn't bring disgrace upon his kingdom. All this had taken place. Once all this was completed, the women were taken to the royal treasure room. In there, they were able to look at all of the jewels and the, the gold necklaces and rings. All of that was at their disposal. They could adorn themselves however they like with these jewels. Not only did they have the privilege of wearing these jewels for their night with the king, but the scripture says that they were allowed to keep whatever they wore. Can you imagine? Can you imagine, ladies, walking into a treasure room and anything you could put on was yours? All for the service of the king. Can I tell you that being in the service of the king has its perks? Come on, somebody. You will live your best life in the service of Jesus. In the service of the king of kings. Psalms chapter 16 verse 11 says, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at that right hand are pleasures forevermore. How many have seen the pleasures of walking with Jesus? Psalms chapter 30 verse 11 says, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and has girded me with gladness. Proverbs chapter 10, uh, verse 6, part A says, Blessings are upon the head of the just. How many want blessings this morning? You have to walk with the Lord. We are blessed when we uh, go in. We're blessed when we come out. Abraham's blessing, the scripture says, belongs to you when you walk with the Lord. How many are thankful for his blessings? So we find after a year of preparation, each maiden would eagerly wait for their name to be called. No doubt each maiden was clothed in the finest of linen, covered from head to toe with jewels. However, Esther was different. Esther made a different choice. We find in chapter 2, verse 13, it says, Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given to her to go uh, with her out of the house of the women unto the king. Jump down to verse 15. Now when it was Esther's turn, the daughter of Abnel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, when it was time for her to go into the king, she required nothing. But what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked on her. So Esther saw something that the other women didn't. She knew that if she was going to win the heart of the king, it wasn't going to be by the jewels that hung around her neck. It wasn't going to be by the jewels, the crowns that was on her head and the rings on her finger. It was going to be just her. It was just, it was the king's order that the women could keep all of these jewels. This was a test by the king. Were these women in it for the stuff or were they in it for him? What were they pursuing? 
Was it the clothes? Was it the crown and the jewels? The only thing that they were interested in? Or was it him and him alone? No doubt some of these women walked into the chamber loaded with jewels to maybe to the point where they could even hardly walk. Do you think the jewels impressed the king? The jewels didn't impress the king. They were his anyway. Church blessings are great and we're thankful for the blessings. I thank God for the blessings that are on my life. But if all the blessings were to cease, come on, now we're turning a corner. If all the blessings in your life were to cease, would you still follow Jesus? Would you still pursue the heart of the king? Listen, I'm still going to praise him. I'm still going to praise him without the blessings. I'm still going to bless his name because he's worthy. He saved our souls. He brought cleansing power of the blood to our life. He still deserves our praise. Esther presented herself just as she was. And that proved to the king that she was not after what she could get. She was after his heart. You see, the, the, you see it, it was the maiden's best interest to be chosen. It was in their best interest to be chosen king or queen. Because the maidens who were rejected did not return home. Come on, somebody. If they were rejected, they didn't go back to mom and dad. They didn't go back to find a husband and to have a family. The rejected maidens were forever in the service of the king. They were sent to the house of the concubines. Do we all know what a concubine is? They were sent to the house of the concubines. So we have a choice. We can either be a chosen one. We can either be the one or we can be one of many. In your spiritual life, do you want to be the one or do you want to be one of many? With all the odds against her. Esther was chosen. We find in verse 17, it says, And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in the sight more than all the other virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head, and he made her queen. Instead of Vashi. When Esther was chosen to be queen, everything changed. The first thing she did, she moved out of the house in waiting and into the palace. This move gave her unlimited access to the king. She gained unprecedented authority. She appointed or she spoke on behalf of the king. Her words, her actions carried the full weight of the government behind them. Her words were so powerful that they were used to save Israel. Her words. Everything, and I say again, everything changed from that moment on. We find that everything that belonged to the king now belonged to her. Forget the jewels that she could have loaded herself with. Would you rather have a pocket full of jewels or would you rather have them all? Come on, somebody. She had unlimited resources. When she became queen, unlimited resources. She was without need. Every desire that she had was met. Come on, stay with me. If you've heard anything, hear this. Spiritually, the church, this church, this body of believers, I believe we're like an Esther. We're not from royalty. Anybody here from royalty? We're common, everyday people. Some of us may have been orphaned in the natural, maybe even orphaned spiritually. Some of you that are now faithful to this house never thought you would end up here. Come on, it's all right. 
before our night with the king, we may have felt small, unimportant, insignificant. But a call has went out to this house. We have been responsive to that call. Years ago, we were whisked away and began the purification process. Come on, we've seen many hard times. How many have seen some hard times? We've been in training. We've learned to walk like a queen and live in faithfulness and righteousness and holiness. Romans chapter 6 verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should not obey in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourself to God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You got to live holy. You got to live righteously. You have to walk in the ways of God. Remember the tents that were used for the perfume on the bodies. I believe this congregation has built a tabernacle of praise. We have saturated this place with praise and worship for 45 years. The Bible says that our praise and worship go up before the Lord like a sweet smelling fragrance. And the oil and the myrrh represents the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Come on somebody, we're nothing without the Holy Ghost. We've learned that we cannot make it without the anointing. Does it matter how good you can preach and how good you can sing? If you're not anointed, it ain't going to go far. You see, the oil of myrrh was a purifier. It expelled the poison and the toxins that were in the skin, giving the women beautiful, smooth complexions. See, the same is said of the anointing. The anointing anointing will get the junk out of your life. If you walk and live in the anointing, there's no time and room for the junk of the world. The anointing is a yoke breaker. Come on, somebody. It's a yoke breaker. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27 says, And it shall come to pass in the day that his burden shall be taken away off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Notice that it says destroyed. That the anointing destroys the yoke. Can I tell you when something is broke, it can be fixed. When something is broke, it can be fixed. But when something is destroyed, it's not coming back. Come on, we need some yokes destroyed. Come on, we need the yoke of sin destroyed. We need burdens destroyed. And the anointing is here to do that. The presence of the Lord is here. Revival is here. I believe there have been congregations all over this country that have had their night with the king. And what whatever reason. For whatever reason, it didn't work out, it didn't turn out. Either the king rejected them or they rejected the king. That's not for us to figure out. But I believe our time has come. I believe our time has come. We're stronger than we have ever been. We're more anointed than we've ever been. We're more capable than ever to carry out the plan of God. I believe it's time that we walk from the house in waiting to the palace. I believe that it's time that as the anointing intensifies, that we step in closer in front of the king's abode. I believe it's time that we have our night with the king. I believe we're about to enter a place we've never entered to before. I believe we're about to enter into the inner circle, the inner chambers of the King of Kings. And his attention is about ready to be focused on us. And I'm determined to be a chosen one. Come on, we have set our eyes on one thing and one thing alone, and that's the heart of the King. We're not here after the jewels. We're not here after the blessings. We're not here after the prosperity. We're here after the king himself. The king of kings. The Lord of lords. And I'm determined not to be sent to the house of the concubines. 
I'm determined. I want to live with the king. I don't want one night with the king. I want to live with the king. I'll not be satisfied with the king only visiting me two or three times a year. Oh, yeah, there's some churches that are content with that. They're content with the moving of the Holy Spirit two or three times a year. They're content with God showing up several times a year and then for the rest of the year going back to their way. Don't get me wrong. They're still in the service of the king. They're still in the kingdom. But they have not chosen the best path. A daily habitation of his presence. Daily encounters with the king of kings. And can I tell you that doesn't come cheap. There's a cost. Esther had to give up her own will. She had to give up her own desires outside of the kingdom. Anything that she had planned to do outside of being bought to the house of the women, she gave up. Maybe she desired to get married and go be a merchant's wife. I don't know. All of that had to go. All of that had to go when she bought, when she came into the king of the house. What are you willing to let go this morning? What are you willing to let go? What baggage are you willing to let go? Sometimes we have to let people go. Sometimes we have to let situations go. We have to let a job go to be in service of the king. Do you long to live the life with daily visitations of the king? You know, those times when you're not really even thinking about the Lord, but he shows up just because he wants to be with you. Can I tell you that position requires a life of preparation? It requires a life of preparation. You might be in the aisle at Walmart and suddenly you feel the presence of the Lord and the leading of the presence of the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. A daily habitation of his presence. You see, when we are chosen, everything changes. The first thing we do is move. We move out of the house and waiting and into the palace. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 2 says, Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cord and strengthen thy stakes. I believe a shift is coming. A change is coming. Look at your neighbor and say, honey, we're about to move. We're about to move. There's about to be a shift in my life. I'm not going to be in the same place I was last week. Because a shift is coming to my spirit. You've got to move. You've got to shift. You can't stay where you're at. It's time to move out of your comfort zone. It's time to move out of the things that we commonly know and move into things that the Lord has for us. He's commanding us to move. The next thing that is about to happen is we're about to gain unlimited authority. I believe in the spirit realm and in the natural. See, when Esther spoke on behalf of the king, her words became law. We are about to speak on behalf of the king and our words will become law in the spirit. I also believe we're gained, we will gain authority in this city. We will gain influence in this city. Malachi chapter 4 verse 3 says, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the sole of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. Luke chapter 10 verse 19 says, Behold, I give you power. Somebody say me. I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing by shall any means harm you. I believe that. I believe as a believer, you better watch what you say. You have power to bless in your mouth and you have power to curse. So many times we curse and we don't even realize what we're saying. Oh, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Curse. 
Oh, there's no, I don't see a revival coming curse. Oh, I don't know if the Lord can do this or that curse. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 is the verse. It says, life and death are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You're going to eat it one way or the other. You're going to eat your curse or you're going to eat your blessing. Come on, somebody. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use of edifying. Let it may minister grace unto the hearers. Come on, tell the person next to you, I'm, not gonna, I'm only going to say what the king says. I'm only going to say what the king says. Next we find that everything belonging to the king belongs to us. I believe we're about to enter a season of unlimited resources and unlimited favor. Come on, all the years of just having enough. Come on, are you tired of that? The years of just barely meeting ends meet. I believe they're over. Not only are we going to have more than enough, we're going to have the desires of our heart be granted. Psalms chapter 37 verse 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give thee the desires of your heart. It doesn't say ask the Lord for the desires. Yes, we're to ask, we're to seek, we're to knock. But it says, first of all, first of all, delight yourself in him. Delight yourself in the Lord. We're about to enter a season With an open heaven over this house. Miracles. We need miracles. We need miracles. I believe we're about to see a season of miracles. I'm not talking about the kingdom age. Come on somebody. That's later. I'm not talking about living in the kingdom age. I'm talking about right here, right now. And I'm not talking about the world. I believe things in the world are going to get worse. Can I be clear on that? I believe almost from this point on, according to scripture, I believe right now is the best it's going to get. I believe as we continue closer to the coming of the Lord, if the scripture is going to be fulfilled, it has to get worse. But as believers, as partakers of his kingdom, we don't have to participate in it. We don't have to participate in it. I'm talking about a time where we don't need doctors because we're walking in divine health. As Pastor Steve preached a couple weeks ago on the vessels, there was a drought in the land. That widow was hungry people around her were hungry but through the divine miracle of God the oil didn't run out to all the vessels were filled I believe we're entering that type of season as you go to Walmart and the bill keeps going up and up and up and you're not getting any more than you've ever gotten and it takes 30 bucks to get to Walmart and gas You can't afford to go. I believe, listen, I believe you, we're entering a season where we can go out and lay hands on that gas tank and say, in the name of Jesus, you're not going to run out until provision comes. I believe that. Can the Lord do it? If the Lord can save my soul, if he from 2,000 years ago can stretch down in his precious blood from 2,000 years ago, is just as powerful today to save lost souls. I believe he can do that. Do you think oil's a problem for God? It's not a problem for God. I believe for the that's why you got to get connected to the kingdom cuz it's going to get bad out there folks. It's going to get bad. But we are to be the light. We are to have the answer. We are to take what the Lord provides and help people. I believe we're the ones to help people. 
I'm talking about heaven on earth. Not heaven itself. I'm talking about the authority of heaven on earth through us. The kingdom in operation through us. When Jesus was here, he was fully operating in the kingdom on earth. His authority was in the kingdom of God. His power was in the kingdom of God. His resources were in the kingdom of God. And he operated on earth. And he used his resources in the kingdom of God to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to feed the 5,000. Come on, we need to walk in that authority. We need to walk in it. I'm talking about living daily in his supernatural presence. Supernatural miracles. Are you ready? Listen, we need it more now than we've ever needed it. We need it more now than we've ever needed it before. It's time. If the church of Jesus Christ across the world doesn't stand up now, I don't know when it's going to. To touch a hurting world. To reach out to the hopeless. But it's a decision. It's a decision. We can sit around all day long and say, well, the Lord ain't done it yet. And the Lord's sitting and waiting on us to operate in our authority. He's waiting. How many will answer the call this morning? Will you answer the call? Stand with me.